Well, my name is Ron Kamen. I'm uh, both the president of the New York Solar Energy Industries Association, which is all the solar industry, all the solar businesses in the state, or most of them, as well as the chairman of Earthkind Solar. Um, Earthkind Solar Energy, basically, our motto is partnering with you today for a sustainable tom tomorrow. Um, we take that pretty seriously for a lot of different reasons that we'll talk about another time. But basically, our mission is to make solar easy. Um, we do solar hot water, we do solar heat, we do solar electric, PV, and basically we're project developers. Um, as a solar developer, it is our mission to work with our customers to figure out how much energy you're using. First, Chris and her team comes in and saves you energy and does energy efficiency, then we work with you to figure out what the right solution is. We'll tell you about the solar piece of this in a little while. It's great also having a biodiesel option here. But basically our mission is to help customers figure out what they want to do, what they can afford to do, and then making sure in our evaluated proposition that we give you the best design, the engineering, the incentives, obviously very important incentives, but also financing, public-private partnerships with the tax credits, project management, equipment procurement, installation, as well as long-term maintenance agreements. So I think you guys probably have heard this statement before. It's about 100 some odd years old. I put my money on the sun and solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal runs out before we tackle that. Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison, thank you very much. The guy who created all this energy, electricity around us, Con Edison, General Electric, all those various companies came from this guy and the work that he did. Interesting statement over 100 years ago, right? So you take a look at the sun. Ah, interesting. In one second, the sun generates more energy than we've all used in all of human civilization. Obviously, it all doesn't come here. It's spread out throughout the whole solar system, but it's an incredible power source, as Edison said. Interestingly enough, some scientists up at Albany um, identified that when you look at all the world energy usage, it's about 16 terawatts trillion watts, okay, massive amount of energy, all right? And then they looked and they said, oh, what does that look like when you start looking and compare that to fossil fuels? And you look at natural gas and how much natural gas there is, and petroleum, and uranium, and coal, the big mama, the big king coal, right? And all that looks substantial compared to that 16 terawatts, but it's all limited, and eventually we keep using more energy, we're gonna use it up faster and faster, and that'll be it. So let's take a look on the other side of the renewables that we get every year, and you take a look at the, the wave, excuse me, the waves and the tidal and geothermal and the hydropower and the biomass and the wind power, and then you compare that to one big other option. And you're looking at 23,000 terawatts of energy per year that comes to the earth that we clearly could, should, might be taken advantage of. So looking at New York City, largest emissions of CO2 in New York City comes from where? What percentage of people think come from all the vehicles that we use and transport and everything else? About 20%, 21%. And the piece that comes from building in terms of carbon emissions? Nearly 80%. And of the emissions in this New York City, the densest concentration of electric power in the world, the buildings, which do about 80% of the carbon, Actually, in those buildings, more than half the energy is for heat and hot water. Heat's about two-thirds, hot water's about one-third. So in this, the densest concentration of electric power in the world, still more than half the energy we use here in New York City is for heat and hot water. You look elsewhere around the country, the percentage gets even worse. It's much more, a much larger percentage. But clearly, there's an opportunity. So many folks know of solar electric, right? So basically these solar electric panels, most people in the US think of solar, they think of solar electric. What happens is you take a sort of semiconductor, the same stuff that's basically in computers, silicon and other similar substances. Sun hits it, it creates electricity. But of all the energy that hits those panels for solar electric, you get about 15 or 20% of the energy that's hitting it that gets converted into electricity. It's great, I mean, hey, it's free, take it, do it, whenever you can do it, it makes a lot of sense, but there's increasing efficiencies that are happening in solar electric that will keep moving things along. On the other side, most people in this country don't think about another part of the sun, which we use all the time, like on a day like today, and that is the heat part, the thermal part. And in particular, solar water heating, which actually, when you take a look at the amount of energy that you get out of a solar water heater, you get over 70% of the energy 
transferred into heat to heat hot water. The key component of a solar thermal or solar hot water system is the collector. What happens is basically you put a fluid in it. It could be water, but here, because of freezing, we put a food-grade glycol so it can freeze down to minus 30 and nothing will happen to the collector. That anytime there's heat up there, the collector grabs that energy. And what happens is that instead of putting cold water into your normal system, whether you have gas or oil or whatever heating up your, your hot water, what you do is instead of the cold water going directly into your system, you run it through the solar thermal system first. You let the sun heat up as much as you can, and then your other system is there as a backup. So, whoops, sorry about that. So what happens in just looking at a household kind of thing is basically you have the collectors on the roof, there's piping that goes up to the collectors. There's a controller which has a, a, a gauge on it. It senses how much heat is up there versus how hot your tank is. If there's enough heat, it sends the fluid up, grabs the heat, brings it down. It puts it then into a storage tank, exchanges that heat, and heats up the water using the power of the sun. Pretty simple technology, been around a very long time, hundreds of years actually. And when you take a look around the world, what you find is actually solar thermal, and like in this country, there's 10 times as much solar thermal installed worldwide as there is solar electric. And it's almost as much as now wind, even though wind is taken on very quickly. Taking a look around the world, actually the world leaders in solar hot water technology and solar hot water installation is China. It's followed not too far behind by Turkey and Germany and a whole bunch of other companies, countries. That second one, who do you think is number two in solar thermal? Japan. Good guesses. It's actually the United States. But why? It's not because we use it to heat our hot water, it's because we use it to heat our pools. I mean, we could use it for pools, why can't we use it for hot water? Thank you very much. All right, so you take a look at solar thermal in Germany. Just to give you a sense, by the way, these slides will all be available um, on a PowerPoint presentation on a video, so I'm going to speed things up because I have five minutes left. But take a look at Europe, 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 just to give you a sense. Take a look at the world leader in solar electric and solar thermal is Germany. Germany has less solar than we have in New York. We have 25% more than Germany. And basically what you do with solar hot water is you size one collector for every two people. So it's one collector, two collector, three collectors, four. You can do it many more. You can do a whole dorm, as SUNY State University of New York at Binghamton did. You do multifamily housing units in terms of condos. You can do Wadsworth Terrace in the Bronx, as they did, who are saving over 3,000 gallons of oil a year. You can do hospitals like Benedictine Hospital. You can do senior citizens' apartments and nursing homes like Hawthorne Ridge did. And luckily, there's tax credits to help make this even more affordable. 30% federal tax credit, 25% state tax credit for residents. And if you're not a residential institution, you can actually, on a commercial level, take advantage of something called accelerated depreciation on a commercial level, which gives you benefits as well. And to give you a sense of the cost, on a per collector basis, and you have to size the collectors again, one for every two people, $5,000 collective price, federal tax credit, state tax credit, brings you down to $2,000 or so for the net price. Of that $2,000, you're going to save every collector at least about 75 gallons of oil per year. That annual savings of $4 a gallon, which I think is pretty cheap, actually, looking at what's about to happen in the gallons, is about $300 a collector. And over 25-year savings with a small 5% annual increase, which is much smaller than what we're getting recently, that's $14,000. So a $2,000 investment gets you $14,000, um, not to mention the carbon savings. Altogether, if you look at the energy you're going to get out of your solar system and you do say, oh, I'm going to get 25 years out of it, ah, that's about the energy savings is about 83 cents per gallon of oil. So the savings are pretty dramatic. All right, another system. So that's hot water. Then the other piece is hot air. Not applicable to many buildings, but on the other hand, if you have an air heating system, as many buildings do, um, you can actually generate heat from the sun as well. And these are solar wall, that FedEx building, that Walmart this uh, apartment building, those municipal buildings, and what happens is you install a plenum of basically uh, metal, perforated metal outside a building's skin. The metal grabs the sun, it sucks the heated air up, it puts it into your heating system, and then you get heat, free heat from the sun. Um, it's kind of interesting that the world's tallest solar collector is in Windsor, Ontario. That's an apartment building. Here's another one with Toronto Community Housing. Here's another one with Manitoba Housing Authority. And here's Alberta, Calgary. It actually looks like a lot of New York City buildings that I've seen, but I haven't seen one solar wall in New York City yet, partially because of the heating systems, but partially because we don't know enough about it. However, 
if your building is too tall for solar hot water this basically can go up about twenty floors or if you don't have an air heating system what can you do and a third option is to take a look at solar electric because that's another option even though it's not heat yet it's an option if you can't do either of those heat sources and offset directly and interestingly enough when you take a look at solar electric yeah, PV, solar electric still cost a bit more than utility delivered prices today, but that is changing dramatically. Prices are coming down across the board. The incentives that out, are out there, if you identify the right incentives, can make that cost competitive today. And within the next 10 years, solar is going to be the cheapest source of electric power in the world. And you're going to have all these options, solar hot water, solar air heating, solar electric. What's right for you? What's right for your facility? What's right for your building? You have to take a look at, but hopefully... Um, you do, and we can all start to work towards a more sustainable world. Thank you very much. My contact is Thank you, Ron.